Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. As you know, every January we have a Back in the Saddle safety event, as well as a Day of Remembrance. This year, in memory of the 15th anniversary of Columbia, we've planned an event that focuses on what we learned from the recovery and reconstruction of Columbia regarding crew survivability and how that's been incorporated into the spacecraft under development today. I'd especially like to welcome family members Evelyn Husband Thompson and her husband Bill, Lonnie McCool and J.P. Harrison with us, and also welcome Jonathan Ward, who's co-author with Mike Leinbach on a new book about the recovery of Columbia, and his wife Jane. More than half of the civil servants working here at JSC today have been hired since we lost Columbia, and also likely the same is true of our contractor community. Challenger happened 15 years after Apollo 1, and Columbia happened 17 years after Challenger. Perhaps we're entering that time frame where the lack of firsthand experience with an accident makes us more vulnerable, either to complacency or just not fully appreciating how actions and decisions affect risk. These considerations make it especially important that we talk about lessons learned. And the hardest of those lessons is how heartbreakingly painful it is to lose a crew. While the SDS-107 crew members serve as role models to people around the country and the world, <coughs> we remember them here very personally as our friends and colleagues and neighbors. To quote then President Bush at his tribute to the Columbia crew at the JSC Memorial 15 years ago, to leave behind earth and air and gravity is an ancient dream of humanity. For these seven, it was a dream fulfilled. Each of these astronauts had the daring and discipline required of their calling. Each of them knew that great endeavors are inseparable from great risks, and each of them accepted those risks willingly, even joyfully, in the cause of discovery. It's our responsibility to understand and manage those risks and ensure that the overall risk is commensurate to the missions we ask our crews to undertake. Part of, that, part of doing that well is learning from our past. I'd like to thank a couple of people who do regularly talk about this. Ralph Rowe, now the agency chief engineer, who speaks about Columbia lessons learned frequently, especially to early career people around the agency and Nigel Packham, who has given many presentations on the Columbia Crew Survivability Report. Today, you'll hear about what led to that report and how we've incorporated it into Orion and commercial crew program vehicles. And now I'd like to invite up Rex Walheim, the Deputy Director of Safety and Mission Assurance. <clears throat> As you know, tomorrow will mark the 15th year since the Columbia accident. I miss my astronaut classmates and friends that I lost on Columbia, and I think about them often, and I reflect on the great people they were and what I learned from them. Today we are focusing on the valuable lessons we gained from the tragedy and the legacy each one of these pioneers left with our agency and the country. We've learned a great deal from Columbia, and we're committed to real change. Immediately following the completion of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, every employee was issued the report and the dialogue continues to this day across the agency. The Safety and Mission Success Initiative began an assessment of leadership practices and cultural norms that affect the safety and influence decisions. The governance model was bolstered, providing a template for how technical authority would be implemented to inform decisions. Encouraging dissent is a leadership obligation and our decision <coughs> processes resolve dissenting opinions in open forums. We took a hard look at our at crew survivability and how we can improve future spacecraft designs to endure the most severe environments. In safety and mission assurance, we made significant efforts towards ensuring mission success and getting our work done safely. We have honed our probabilit probabilistic risk assessment skills and capabilities to, to be among the best in the world at informing risk trades and decisions. We've developed and implemented safety and mission assurance technical excellence program to provide a comprehensive education necessary to prepare our workforce to meet the demanding technical <coughs> expectations. And we've defined what a positive safety culture is and are continuing to illuminate methods to enhance it. The comp key components of the safety culture are that we report our concerns with no fear, we are just and treat each other fairly, we are flexible to meet any challenges that come our way, we learn from our successes and mistakes, and we engage to do our part. I want to welcome our panel speakers, and each of them has a unique perspective on how we rose up following the Columbia to complete the shuttle program successfully and move on to meet the challenging demands of future programs. 
Now I'd like to turn it over to Brian Kelly, better known as BK, our Director of Flight Operations. All right. Uh, thanks very much for all of the introductions. I'm going to dive right into this, and what I'm going to do is introduce uh, our panel of leaders up here, and then we're going to have a great opportunity to sh share what we know. Uh, let me start out with Wayne Hale to my right here. Wayne began his 32-year career at uh, NASA in flight operations. Started out as a prop systems guy before his first shuttle flight, before the first shuttle flight. Uh, Well-known flight director for over 15 years. Uh, supported, led over 40 uh, uh, shuttle flight assignments. Um, joined the, the, the shuttle program in 2003, ultimately rising up to be the deputy program manager and then program manager. Uh, serves on a number of space-related advisory boards in addition to being the director of human spaceflight, director of energy for special aerospace services. Uh, let's welcome Wayne Hale. <clears throat> Another longtime friend, uh, Mike Leinbach over here, well-known launch director and noted author. Uh, this guy was the, uh, the shuttle launch director at KSC for the final uh, 11 years of the shuttle program. He led KSC's initial Columbia de debris recovery effort <clears throat> excuse me, in Texas, and thereafter he led the uh, reconstruction team. He was a driving force behind the Columbia preservation team. And his book, Bringing Columbia Home, tells an inside story of, uh, of the 25,000-person effort to find Columbia's debris and reconstruct it. Let's hear it from Mike Leinbach. <laughs> Another guy that uh, grew up in flight operations, uh, Mark Kirisich. He began his career in 1983 at JSC, is a member of the Space Shuttle Flight Operations Team. Quickly advanced to the position of a lead uh, shuttle payload officer. Selected as a flight director in 1996, supported multiple uh, shuttle missions and ISS ex expeditions. In 2006, he was selected to be the deputy program manager in, in Orion, and recently he's been leading our Orion program. Uh, let's hear it from Mark, Mark Kirsten. <clears throat> Uh, Kathy Leaders. Kathy started out at White Sands, uh, you know, uh, working on Ohm's pods, working on uh, RCS uh, shuttle systems as a depot manager. She moved over to the space station program. We were there together for quite some time. Uh, many improving and higher uh, level jobs. And recently she became the commercial crew program manager. And actually not recently, it was quite some time ago. And has been leading that effort for quite some time. And as such, she works with the program's commercial providers, Boeing, SpaceX, and also working hard to ensure that human spaceflight to the International Space Station comes home to the United States of America. So let's hear it for Kathy. Uh, Colonel Pat Forster, a man I've known for over a quarter of a century, uh, retired U.S. Army colonel, uh, an aviator, test pilot, and is currently our chief astronaut in the astronaut office. Uh, we selected him as an astronaut back in 1996. It's, it's been a while. Uh, he's flown three shuttle missions, uh, logging over 1,000 hours or nearly 1,000 hours in space, four spacewalks, uh, almost 26 hours of EVA. He's had varying assignments in, in flight operations, a technical assistant to the director, a CAPCOM in both uh, our, our current programs, or post, or shuttle and station, and until recently he was the um, astronaut office re representative to the NASA Engineering and Science uh, Center. Um, uh, and prior to uh, appointing him to his current position, he was the deputy chief of the astronaut office. So let's hear it for uh, Pat. Okay, so the, starting out, we want to set the tone. You know, uh, where were you when we lost Columbia? What were you doing? What were these immediate impacts, the, the personal impacts, and, and what was that starting point for you? Let's, let's start with Wayne Hale. So uh, I had just taken a rotational assignment down at the Kennedy Space Center to, to uh, lead the shuttle program uh, and the launch preparations, uh, working closely with 
the guy on my right, Mike Lombach, and, and the rest of the KSC team. Uh, and uh, I was with Mike on, on, the, on the morning of February 1st, uh, first in the firing room and then out at, out at the landing site. Uh, uh, but the thing that I wanted to talk about uh, after the event happened, and we were so uncertain as to what exactly had happened, we were back in the, in the launch control center trying to watch CNN and, and other sources, and uh, it was just really hit me that this was a tragic event, but I was hopeful uh, as we had worked with the shuttle launch uh, escape suits and parachutes and all the equipment that we put on after Challenger, and I knew that the, uh, the shuttle cockpit was pressurized volume, shell inside another um, aero shell, the out, outer mold line of the vehicle. Um, I was very hopeful that uh, some of the things we had practiced for in shuttle crew breakups or shuttle vehicle breakups would come to pass, that the crew would be protected by those double walls, that their, their su uh, suits would inflate and give them oxygen to breathe until they got low enough to, to pop the side hatch open and use those parachutes and bail out. So I violated all the protocol about an hour, maybe less, after the, after the event and called the MCC because I still had my flight director phone list cheat sheet and called the LSO, Marty Lindy, and I said, Marty, have they picked up any of the ELTs, any of the uh, electronic locator transmitters that go off automatically when the chute deploys on every astronaut's backpack? And, and he said no. And I think that was when I realized that it was really, really bad day. And the rest of the day I was numb in shock, I can look back on it now. We were all going through the motions. We got the contingency action plan out. We activated the, the recovery team, uh, which I'm sure uh, Mike will talk a lot more about. And, and I watched them, went down and, and watched them load in the, uh, in the aircraft at the shuttle uh, landing facility to go uh, off to East Texas to start the recovery. But, but I gotta tell you, it was like a death in the family. If you've had a family member pass suddenly, then you know. Uh, and I was in shock the whole, well, for days. And, uh, and it took us several days uh, to get through that and just push through and do what we needed to do. All right, thank you. So Mike, um, maybe you can set the stage for what we used to do in preparation for uh, shuttle landings, where you were, what the setup was, and what these immediate impacts were from your perspective. Yeah, Bobby, whoops, I'll be glad to do that. Um, landing day at the Kennedy Space Center and, and here at Johnson Space Center too is invariably a day of celebration. We were going to welcome our crews back home, the families were there welcoming their loved ones back home. Uh, never expected a, an accident on landing, frankly, um, so it was always a day of celebration. I showed up in the Launch Control Center early that morning to watch the deorbit burn, as I always did, and, and that went fine. Went racing out to the, the midfield park side at the shuttle landing facility, met up with Wayne and, and some other folks out there, our administrator and associate administrator, other folks, friends. Um, and we were watching and, and waiting for Columbia to come home. And, and when the calls to the crew went unanswered, that was kind of our first cue that something was wrong. Um, the next cue was no sonic booms. The next cue was when we, we, we had a countdown clock between us standing there waiting for the landing and the, and the runway itself, maybe 50 yards in front of us, 20 yards in front of us. That ticked down to zero. Columbia should have been right there. Columbia was, we didn't know where Columbia was. Um, it was it was a surreal feeling, one of complete <coughs> emptiness. Um, I just remember thinking Columbia is somewhere between orbit and the Kennedy Space Center, and we had no idea where it was. About three minutes prior to that, when we didn't hear the booms, I looked at Wayne, and I said, well, what do you think? And, and one word came out of Mr. Hale's mouth, and it was beacons, just like he just described. He was already thinking about how to find them. And so it went from a day of celebration to a day of complete emptiness. Um, 
Bill Reedy, associate administrator, had the, our contingency plan for space flight operations in his hand that Administrator O'Keefe had ordered updated shortly after he took office, uh, just a couple of months earlier, as I recall. And so we, we got the plan out. It was to name a, a, a lead NASA representative for the whole thing, and that turned out to be Dave King from the Marshall Space Flight Center. <coughs> um, when Columbia was not in front of us, the emptiness, folks, I, I can't describe it. it. It is just, we didn't know what to do. We had always been knowing what to do as a flight directors, launch directors, crew, program managers, our, our positions and yours are, are ones of knowledge and control. And at that moment, we had neither. So we raced on over to the, uh, to the launch control center, a few, a few folks, and up to my office, and we turned on CNN, and then we first saw the trails. And so um, we took it from there. We had our first meeting in the launch control center one hour after the accident, after which, or some time after which, we learned that the first crew member was being found in Texas. Uh, we had no idea. And so it, the, the rest of the day is sort of a blur. Um, but we got on that plane that night and came out here and met Dave Whittle from the Mishap Investigation Team at the Barksdale Air Force Base where he initially set up <coughs> shop up there and, um, and just tried to scratch together a plan. Um, it was just a day you cannot imagine, and I hope you never do. Um, that's where I was. All righty. Mark, flight operator, tactical planning, where were you? <coughs> Yeah, thanks, BK. Um, I had a little different experience uh, than Wayne and Mike because at the time I, I was in flight operations, mission operations we used to call it, but I was on the space station side. And just a couple months earlier in November, uh, we had flown STS-113, the shuttle flight STS-113, which was the flight immediately prior to STS-107. And one of, the, one of the main objectives of that flight was to deliver the sixth space station crew uh, to the space station. Uh, Ken Bowersox, Nikolai Budarn, and Don Pettit. And, and I happened to be the Expedition 6 lead flight director. So I had, I had a different job, uh, you know, November, December, January, and then coming into the morning of February 1st. And um, I do recollect, you know, space station operations go on. So we had a busy week the week before. There were, I forget exactly, but we had a number of activities scheduled the following week. So that particular morning, I, w it was, I was taking my time at home, just getting ready, getting up. And uh, we didn't usually have the TV on, but for some reason that morning my wife did. And my wife Mary said, Mark, you better come out here. They're talking about the space shuttle. So I went into our family room just about the time Leroy, Leroy Kane, who's you know, a close friend of mine, uh, declared the contingency. And I had, I had the same feelings that, I did share the same feelings that Wayne and Mike described, you know, shock, a feeling of, you know, helplessness. Fog is the word I use a lot. And it took me a while because I sat there. And, uh, but but then, you had, then I had this feeling, you know, I need to do something. And, and I suddenly, I, I recognized a couple things. Well, I, I didn't know any of the crew members of STS-107 personally. I knew, I knew Leroy, I knew the flight control team, I knew the people in the program office. And then I said, hey, that's my crew on board. So, so I got in my car and I went to the control center and uh, to, to make sure they knew they were okay. And by the time I had gotten to the control center, it was probably two hours later, uh, folks had already talked to them. Um, but in, in the ensuing days, again, well, well, the people in the shuttle program were able to, they, they had jobs either reconstructing the trajectory, what had happened, or, or help collect, help get out in the fields. Um, we had, in the space station program, we had kind of a different immediate task because uh, you'll recall at the time, uh, in, in that time frame, uh, we, we hadn't yet flown the ATV or the HTV. We didn't have the commercial resupply ship, so, so Space Station was, was highly dependent on the Space Shuttle uh, for resupply, spare components, not only assembly, but spare parts, food, clothing, things like that. And many of us knew, wow, probably the shuttle's not going to fly again in, anytime soon. So what we did, we did with the program and the control team, we said, boy, we better 
take a stock of where we're at and, and make sure we can support the crew. And at, at the time, again, we didn't even have a good plan of how, how they would come home, what we would do with them. But so we said, you know, it, it was early, relatively early in the space station program. We didn't have, we didn't have an accurate accounting of everything <clears throat> on board, you know, how much food, how much clothes. So we had this idea, boy, we better do a survey. And this is where, you know, one of, the, one of my most poignant memories of being here at NASA since 1983 comes into play. Um, we worked very hard on a survey, a list of questions that we were going to send to the crew, and we were going to send them off looking at all the nooks and crannies of the space station to count things so we would know how long we, we could keep them on board. And we sent the list up. And again, I was not on console. I was in my office about two days later. It was Wednesday morning. <clears throat> And from the control center, I got a phone call, and it was the on-console flight director who said, Mark, you got to come over here. Ken, Ken Bowersox, wants to talk to you. He's really worried about you, was what he said. And I said, wow. So I hung up the phone. As I'm walking over to the control center, I said, boy, Ken, you know, he's so cool. Here he is. You know, he's up there. He's having a ration food. He's wearing his clothes extra days. We're not sure when he's going to come home, and he's worried about me. But I, I got to the control center. We set up a private conference. We went upstairs, and Ken and I were talking. And he reiterated, Mark, I'm, I'm worried about you. I said, well, Ken, what's the matter? And he goes, well, I have the survey here. And actually, before I go on, let me, let me give one more piece of background. If you know Ken, Ken's an ex-Navy pilot, and also Ken is bald. And why that's important, I'll tell you in just a second. And, and of course, it was a, it was a three-person crew. All the, all the crew were men. And that's, that's important because Ken proceeded to read the first question we wrote to the crew. And he, and he goes, Mark, question number one is, please go find and count the number of bottles of hand lotion you have on board the space station. <laughs> and, uh, and Ken goes, Mark, we're three guys. I'm an ex-military guy. How many bottles of hand lotion do you think we need? <laughs> And I said, oh, yeah, yeah good, good question, Ken. Why don't we skip question one? Just go on and do the rest of the survey. Got better, didn't it, Mark? <laughs> oh, yeah. He goes, yes, yeah, so let me tell you about question two. <laughs> he, Please go find and count all the bottles of shampoo that are on board the space station. <laughs> and Ken goes, Mark, do you remember what I look like? <laughs> so about this time, I was saying, boy, I would wish I'd read that note a little bit closer. <laughs> But, uh, but actually, it was really good because, you know, we talked about this, this feeling and that really I was in this fog. I was in the fog for, for days. And, and Ken having that conversation with me really woke me out of it. He was saying, hey, I'm okay. We're okay on board. We're going to be okay. Uh, human spaceflight's going to go on. We're going to work through this. So I really appreciated uh, that phone call with Kevin that day. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kathy. So um, I also was in the space station program. Um, at the time, I was the acting vehicle manager. And um, that Saturday, I got a phone call from Scott Gehring, who was the acting uh, vehicle manager. I was acting deputy vehicle manager. And, and he called me up and said, they're gone. Um, so you know, at that stage, you're, like everybody's mentioned, you're just, you kind of feel like a little bit totally numb inside, but the first thing we had to think about is kind of what Mark was thinking about was, hey, we've got a crew on board, um, and we've got to figure this out. And I remember we all went into, you know, we went to Four South, because it's kind of like you need to be close. You just feel like you need to be close to help. You just want to do something. And, um, and it probably kind of contributed to the list <laughs> that Mark had, but, you know, at the time it was, how, okay, what are our options? You know, we really didn't have a method for certifying cargo on Russian vehicles. We didn't have, you know, you were just starting to pull together plans for, okay, how do we certify food? How do we certify hardware? <clears throat> what do we need? You know, and, and starting in as probably a method of, in some way, mourning, doing something was a way to kind of make you feel like you were helping. And, and, um, by looking and helping the crew on orbit, we we're helping the crew that we lost, right? And, and um, so in the station program I did, it was, it was our way, I think, of, of, 
of mourning and and um, hopefully helping our our fellow program folks over on the shuttle side. The second thing that really struck me was, um, and those who work here at JSC, every day when you walk by, you drive by the um, Johnson Space Center <coughs> sign, you saw how much the community loved NASA, the crew members, you just would see all those flowers and um, balloons and things showing up. Um, and it really, really struck you, you know, every day, Every day we do work that means something to us. But it really showed me that every day we do work that means something to our community and to the, you know, the country. And also to, you found out, to the whole, you know, earth. And um, it was, it really, really struck me. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, we carried on because of that, because we knew that what we were doing was important, not only for ourselves, but for the nation and for our humankind. So it was, it was that um, seeing those mementos really meant a lot to me. Thanks, Kathy. Pat, so where were you? How did it hit you? How was the calm? Yeah, I remember it very well, Saturday morning, uh, beautiful weather. Uh, those of us in the astronaut office uh, were a family and yet we're all uh, living our lives. And uh, uh, my wife and I and our youngest son were headed to Austin for a college visit uh, at UT with two other families. And that day we piled into two cars. Uh, all the men got in one car with our sons and uh, the women, and I think there was one uh, uh, daughter with them headed to Austin and we were driving along probably halfway between here and Austin and my cell phone rang and it was my wife and she said hey do you guys have the radio on I said no we're just up here talking and she said you just turn the radio on so as soon as we did of course the all the channels were uh, carrying the the story of something was going on with Columbia and and it was not good so we pulled off the side of the road uh, I realized the right thing for me to do was to head home. My wife wanted to come home with me, so we got in our car, which was one of the cars, and everybody else crammed in the other car. We handed our son off to uh, these other <coughs> families, and off they went uh, for the college visit, and we headed home. At the time, I was assigned to a mission. I was on uh, SCS 117, so you heard Mark say the, the most recent mission that it launched was 113, so we were really just a few months away from launch ourselves and uh, so as we headed back I was trying to figure out what I needed to do I was probably in a little bit of a fog so I'm not sure who I called first it was probably my commander and uh, the word was get in a flight suit and get out to Ellington we're not quite sure what we're going to do but but that's uh, where we'll be and so we got home dropped my wife off got a flight suit on got out to Ellington and uh, there were several people out there and we were beginning to really get the details of what was happening. Uh, I don't remember how long we were there, but I do remember that toward the end of uh, the time uh, they had announced upstairs that the uh, families were, were on their way back. And uh, I remember actually being out at Ellington when the plane landed. And that was just uh, kind of surreal to me. I had been a family escort. I could picture uh, just that event from being out on the runway all the way to uh, coming back uh, with the families. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, it was hard for me personally because we were on a crew and the word we were getting is, we don't know what happened. It could be something uh, that is determined quickly and we need you to be ready to fly. Uh, obviously that was not the case, but they asked about three or four crews to continue with their training. So, you know, day after day, week after week, we were focusing on our mission in the back of our minds, not thinking that we were really going to fly it, seeing our office mates headed out to the field uh, to help with recovery and, and other things. And that was, I just remember it was a dilemma for me to continue to train as if we were going to fly. Uh, but that's what we did. Eventually, uh, our crew uh, kind of picked up the duties of doing uh, the memorial flybys, we did them at the Naval Academy, we did them in, uh, up at uh, Amarillo, at KSC, and each time we would do that, it would just bring things back, focus back on, on what it was we were doing. Okay, thanks, Pat. 
Now we're going to, the panel's going to kind of shift a teeny bit. Now we're going to go into the, what did we learn, the lessons learned, how do we influence these programs going forward. Uh, let me start out with Wayne. Uh, Wayne, you had major leadership uh, uh, roles after, after the accident, made the crucial decision to move forward with a crew survivability report, uh, variety of lessons learned. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, you, you know, what went into that si decision? How did you de consider the timing of when to do it and how long it would take? Uh, you know, what, what did you learn that we need to carry forward into these new development programs? Very broad. Well, I may take more than three minutes. That's okay. <laughs> I'll give you a little time. So one of the things, uh, when I was in Florida after the accident doing my job down there, kind of an administrative job. We had a full day's worth of work in the office. We were supporting the CABE. We were doing all this stuff, um, you know, all the bureaucratic work that it takes to, to keep things going. But every evening um, after work was done around 5 o'clock, second shift, I'd go out to the reconstruction hangar and see what parts had been shipped back, what evidence had been found, talk to some of the engineers about what the theories were, because for a long time we didn't know what happened. I mean, we knew what happened, but we didn't know why it, it happened. So they were out there looking at, looking at debris, and it's, and it's really um, spooky to see the parts of the spaceship, things that we talked about in mission control and operated and talked about, you know, uh, maintenance at the Cape and maybe upgrades, this, that, and the other, and here were all these parts burned up, caked with mud, parts. And you just, it was very solemn to walk around that. That reconstruction, your second shift was quiet because most, most people were on first shift. They had a kind of a skeleton crew on second. Um, trying to sort pieces. But over in one corner, they had a room. They'd constructed a room. And, and that room was where the, the cabin, crew cabin uh, contents were. Uh, and it was jealously guarded. Uh, it, was, it was felt, you know, we have to be respectful. We don't want sensationalism. We don't want, um, uh, well, you can imagine. So, so it was guarded. And Pam Milroy, bless her heart, was in charge of that room. And getting past Pam, who's about this tall, y you know, I, you didn't easy. get past. Wasn't easy. I mean, here I, I was. I'm the lead program guy, space shuttle program in Florida, and she wouldn't let me in the door. Um, so we had a long conversation about that, and we finally got in. And, 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 and if anything, it was worse inside the room. Because now it was the personal objects, it was the seats, it was the suits, it was the checklists, it was all those things that we knew uh, the crew had worked with, and and uh, and it and, and it and it was bad, uh, and that stayed with me. So, first of July, Bill Parsons, who was the new program, in case you didn't notice, the whole shuttle program management team was changed out. I mean. You can call it what you want to, but they were all changed out. Everybody who had been in a position of decision making before Columbia was moved aside, moved to different jobs, and they brought in a whole new team. And Bill Parsons uh, was named um, the the program manager, and Bill called me and asked me to come back to Houston uh, to be his number two. Uh, and uh, we were supporting the Columbia accident investigation and. Something we've got to talk about, by the way, schedule pressure. We'll come around to that. Uh, the CABE was going to complete their report late summer, put their report out about the 1st of September. And people from certain quarters of NASA headquarters were saying, you guys can fly in October, right? Well, you know, no. And they were not happy with that story, but we, we, we faced a lot of uh, interesting pressure, but one of the things that happened a, a couple of months after I got back to Houston was we had the, uh, the medical folks come. They had a number of medical doctors who had done the forensics, who had done the autopsies, who had done all that forensic work. They were not NASA flight surgeons, they were aeromedical flight surgeons, and, and they had done that work, and they had their report. I don't know, any guys like to watch some of these crime shows where they always go down to the morgue and they have, you know, the, 
the medical examiner and it's da-da-da-da-da, and it, I, I don't particularly like those, but it's not real. You know, it's fake, it's somebody made up, somebody you don't know, well, they came to town and they had a four-hour briefing. And I got to sit through four hours of detailed discussion medically what happened. And I will not, I don't sleep well at night sometimes because of that. And I will not share that with you. It's horrific. Uh, but it was mostly a problem because there are people I knew. You know, it's one thing to watch some show or talk about somebody you don't know, but when it's your colleagues, when it's people you know, uh, wow, um, that's really tough. And the thing that came out was, you know, we, they, there, there were five, I think, fatal situations. In other words, multiple things. And I won't go into that, but I, I, I really, after that, uh, Bill Parsons and I had the uh, crew escape people come uh, talk to us about all the studies that they had done for options to put, you know, you put crew pods in, ejections, you name it. They had studied every option on what might be done to help a shuttle crew get out of an accident. And we noticed one thing, they were centered on the launch phase, because we always considered a launch phase the most dangerous phase, and, and then, uh, and then uh, but the energy is different. It's a situ different situation, <clears throat> and kind of about three-quarters of the way through the briefing, uh, we kind of woke up and we said to the guys, well, what would have made a difference for the Columbia crew? And they said, nothing. We don't have anything. The energy was four times greater than what you have uh, during during the same altitude phase of launch, and there's nothing that we can figure out that you could do differently to save this vehicle, save the people in this vehicle. So, um, you know, there you are. Um, I told you it was going to take more than three minutes. Okay. Uh, another, another few weeks went by, and there was an appointment on my calendar. Uh, Pam <coughs> Milroy and Nigel Packham wanted to see me about something called a crew survivability report, which was a term I had never heard of or, or talked about before. And, and they came to see me and they said, look, we have all this information that we've learned about how the safety devices failed, about the things that were not good, the helmets, and, you know, just a whole raft of things that we learned that didn't work as well as we thought they were going to work and certainly didn't work in this situation. And we think it's important we document. Oh, I forgot to tell you one other part of that. When the doctors were going through this <clears throat> awful four-hour detailed, I'm not a medical person. I don't like medical stuff anyway. They said, oh, by the way, we wanted to find out how this related to the Challenger accident and the Challenger results, and we couldn't find them. We couldn't get access to them. They were hidden away. And over time, the equivalent records, I don't know whether they were lost or there's hidden some archive somewhere, but the docs couldn't find them. They couldn't reference them. And that, that, you know, that struck a nerve. So when Pam and Nigel came to me and said, we've got this report, but a lot of people don't think we ought to publish this. It's sensitive, you know, HIPAA and sensitivity for the crew families and and it, it's just bad kind of looks bad for NASA we, we really don't think we ought to publish this and they said we think Pam and Nigel think it's very important to publish this and there were a whole community of the flight surgeons in agreement with that and I said write it up we'll write you a check for the funding because there's always money involved uh, to get this done I think it's important let's try to make it you know uh, 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 we've got to abide by the HIPAA rules and et cetera, but we want to get the story out. So they spent several months, I think, putting the story together, went through several iterations, got a lot of criticism. A lot of people thought we shouldn't put it out. Yeah, but, but after we went through what, or after I'd been through, and I talked to Bill Parsons, he felt the same way. After what we had been through, it was like, well, they can fire me if they want to. This is important. We're going to do it anyway. Just like we're not going to launch in October. They can fire us if we want to. 
uh, because it's not right. We're going to do this because it's the right thing to do. So we got the report. They did an admirable job. Um, and, uh, and when I got the report, we, I said, we are going to send this report out. So we, we got in the media and we looked at every organization that was talking about space tourism, launching people, doing, you know, Cracker Jack things, maybe in space, and serious people too. And I said, we want to send a copy of this to the CEO or, or chief of every one of these organizations. And I think we sent out about 30 copies with a handwritten note to every one of them said, here's what we learned. Please take what we've learned and design your spacecraft better. And, and, I, and frankly, several of those folks wrote us back and said, thank you. We really appreciate this. This was very important. We found it very useful. But we did it in opposition. There was always opposition. Uh, and sometimes you just have to do what's right, even though, well, I love Bill Parsons, his favorite phrase. I don't know if you know Bill very well. He was a, he was a Marine Corps captain in the infantry. We won't use all of Bill's and, and I'll just, I'll just, but his, but his thing was, what's the worst they can do to us? Shave our heads and send us to Okinawa? <laughs> which is what they did to him in the Marine Corps. So what's the worst they can do to him? So um, we did it anyway. And, uh, and I, I think the report's very good. After, after a number of years, um, the medical community got together and published it in a book form. Uh, it's out there. Um, and it's basically the crew survivability report, a little skinnier for the medical community, LOS, name of the book. Uh, and you can probably find it on Amazon or something. So. Um, you know, I think it was very important. I know these guys have all read it and they've taken it to heart. Um, and, uh, and we want to make the next spacecraft safer. We want to do better by our crews. Okay. Thank you. Mike, I know that you witnessed firsthand, we, many of us did firsthand, uh, the great actions of people uh, uh, in the aftermath of Columbia, uh, reconstruction, gathering the, the debris. Um, you know, Talk a little bit about what your observations were. I, one of the things I just want to mention, Milt, I know Milt's out there, Milt Heflin, who was our chief of the flight director office at the time, kind of hinted at the same kind of questioning. We got a chance to take these great Americans that, that helped the team out and show them mission control. But what, what did you see? What did you witness? What, what we all witnessed was America at its greatest. It, it was the people in, in East Texas and Western Louisiana coming to the assistance of their government, of their country, um, without, without being asked. You, you have to go back to that day and remember that uh, Columbia took 20 minutes to fall out of the sky and it was landing in the backyards of people and out in their fields and, and uh, there were no NASA people on scene immediately and, and it took, took hours for us to get there. Uh, the first responders were the good people of Texas. Um, they uh, really s pretty much saved the day, if, if that seems like an odd thing to say, but they protected the debris, they protected the astronauts. We had clergy from the local communities uh, accompany each, each find. Uh, the sheriffs, the uh, volunteer firefighters, the VFW people, <coughs> whatever was needed, um, they did it. And, and they had no script for this. They, they had a rudimentary incident command system, yes, as most communities do, all should, most do. Um, but, but they did what they felt was right at the time, and, and, um, and God bless them for that because they were the, they were the people that, that got us through that first day, essentially. You know, after we, after we got there that, that night and the next day, as forces started to arrive, um, federal, state, local, well, then we started putting a plan together, but the people of Texas really pulled together. They were, some of the stories became, guys, it was just phenomenal. There, there was one um, little old lady who cooked a chicken and brought it to the VFW hall to feed us, to feed the folks. And she said, I'm very sorry, this is all I can afford. And, she, and, and, the, and Belinda at the VFW hall said, well, Thank you very much. If it weren't for your chicken, those three people over there wouldn't be eating tonight. The people of East Texas served up upwards of 60,000 meals to our folks at no cost to the government. Um, I can't begin to tell you how many eggs 
um, they cracked and, and chickens they cooked. It was just America at its best. And, and again, no script for it. They did what was right. Um, it, was, it was beautiful to see that part of it. The tragedy, of course, was there, but, but it was beautiful to see the people of East Texas come to our assistance. Um, if I could make one point, Keep Rex, going. You're doing good. Rex mentioned um, reading the Rogers Commission report and, and also the CABE report. Um, when I talk to folks back at KSC and, and you guys, I would highly encourage you all to read those two reports. And then, after you've read those two reports, study how NASA responded to those two reports. Wayne touched on it uh, big time here just, just a second ago. But the response to, from the agency to those two reports was, was night and day. And, and God forbid you're ever faced with something like that again. Please adopt the Columbia response if you can, um, given whatever circumstance you have. The, the, uh, the response from the agency was outstanding. It was open communications. It was doing the right thing again, um, just night and day. So please do that, if you will. OK, thank you, Mike. So Mark, uh, Orion's unique. And uh, we're planning to operate beyond uh, uh, low Earth orbit. We haven't been there since Apollo. But what lessons do we need to take forward? What, how are you leading us in that direction to apply what, what we're talking about now? Yeah, BK, as you mentioned, Orion is an exploration spacecraft. Uh, we are going to take the spacecraft and the astronauts farther away from the Earth than we've been since the 70s, and then farther away past that. So, so the spacecraft and the astronauts are going to face challenges that we haven't seen in 40 years. The environment, the radiation levels are higher, the, the temperatures are, the hots are, the, the high temperatures are hotter, the cold temperatures are colder, and when we come home, the energy we have to dissipate coming back to Earth is greater. And, it, and if we have an emergency, if we have a contingency, it takes longer to get home. So there are a lot of, a lot of factors that we have to consider in the design. And, and really, in Orion, I, I was going to hit this from two different aspects. The, the organizational and cultural things we learned, specifically from the CABE report. And then, Wayne, the, the report, the survival report, some of the specific spacecraft lessons learned that we incorporated. So if, if we start with the organizational things, for example, first off, in Orion we have four really strong technical authorities. You know, one of the recommendations from the CABE report, engineering, uh, safety and mission assurance, health and medical, and also we call, we call our FOD reps not only the risk takers, but also a fourth technical authority. We have a really diverse team, engineering backgrounds, educational backgrounds, previous occupations, we're, we're distributed across the agency. We, we like to say we have the best folks from across the agency and now with our international partners actually from around the world. So we get a lot of different opinions and we encourage those. And as the program manager, usually by the time things get to me, there are different opinions and there are alternate opinions. So, so yes, I hear those and, and we listen and encourage dissenting opinions. And we, and we have a risk system. It's, I believe it's a healthy system because because things come and go. Risks pop up, we develop mitigation plans, and, and we burn them down, we lower the risk. And yes, sometimes, you, because, because we're exploring, it's so hard, you know, we've only done it once in our history, sometimes you can't make it all, all go away. So sometimes we accept those residual risks that we have. So I think we've done a lot of things, and, and one of the things, Wayne, that we did, um, really, in, in light of the report, we have, a, we have actually a, a special group in one of our organizations called Crew Systems Integration. It used to be Neil Zapp that led it. Uh, now it's Jason Hutt. Neil just recently left Orion. But um, at our life cycle reviews, we specifically go through the recommendations in the report. So for example, at PDR, at our first CDR, we'll do it again at our Delta. And we go evaluate ourselves on, on how are we doing. In some, in some areas we're doing good, in some areas we still have some work to go. But, but for example, a few of the things, like one of the, one of the chapters talks about dissimilar redundancy and, and degradation of systems. So we focused on that. And, and there are a lot of examples. <laughs> Everything OK? Yep. All Carry right. On. <laughs> yes. Watch out for the debris from the light. Yeah, one example, for example, on, you guys okay? 
Yeah, it's good. I think we just lost a light right up there. We're good to go. Okay. Navigation, for example, here on Earth, you know, I couldn't read the map anymore. Uh, I use Siri to get me where I'm going to. And uh, when, you, when you explore, unfortunately, we don't have a universal GPS yet. So we are still dependent on ground stations. The Deep Space Network will track Orion, and the control center here will deve develop new state vectors and uplink them. But as an example of a dissimilar redundancy, <clears throat> You know, should anything happen, uh, either the comm system on the spacecraft or, or the, the network here, uh, we have this thing called an optical navigation system, which, which is a high precision optical vice, which by looking at the Earth, by looking at the moon, can figure out where the spacecraft is and, and navigate back home so the crew can get back, again, with a dissimilar, dissimilar redundancy. Uh, survival, survival systems. Again, when you're so far away, survival takes on a new meaning, and one of the things we had to consider when you're in LEO, the people working at Space Station know this, if, if there's a really bad problem, you can hop in a spacecraft and you can be back on the ground in two hours really quickly. When, when we're in orbit, especially these, these NROs, near rectilinear orbits, we're talking about building the gateway, and it takes days, could be six, seven, or eight days to get home. So we looked at what are the survival situations there? And for example, one of the things is, again, survival talks about when you go beyond the redundancy and the designed in, in, in safety factor. So one of the really bad things could be cabin lake. So we put all of the critical systems you need to get home on, on water cooling. It's not, not air cooled, so if there's nowhere, the spacecraft continue to operate. And we're building the suits uh, such that the crew can don them. It won't be very comfortable but it's a way to get home, and, and we have a closed-loop air system which will return the crew home. So we've, we've thought about survival in this, in this case. And I know Kath, Kathy's done some of this too, but one of the, <clears throat> one of the things we picked up from the survival, um, from Wayne, the report that Wayne and Pam did, is how very important just, just the seats and the suits are. And, and designing the seats and the suits and the operator and the spacecraft system, look, taking a look at it from an integrated perspective. So it, it sounds simple, but it, it actually takes quite a bit of work. And I don't know if Dustin Gomert's here today, but boy, he's dedicated the, the past few years to this. But the, the seats, the suits fit the seats very well. And the restraint systems uh, hold the crew, and, and the, the crew's torsos won't move, the, the, their arms can be restrained. And, the helmets, a lot of, we learned a lot about helmets. And the report actually re uh, recommended conformal, but we found it's not so much conformal it is, is make sure the head moves with the helmet so you're not bumping your head against the helmet. <clears throat> we have a closed-loop ecosystem so we don't have to run uh, oxygen through. And, and lastly, we have, we have a requirement. We're actually holding the spacecraft uh, to an occupant protection standard, the Brinkley standard, which, which is used in a number of applications but we look at all sorts of nominal landings, contingency landings, and we evaluate how protected the crew is in those kind of situations. So, Wayne, for you and Pam, and I know a lot of people, about, in addition, contributed to that report. I can tell you it's, it's not only been read, but it's alive and well in Orion, and we look at it periodically. So thanks for leaving us with that. All right, Kathy. You've been tasked with the, the daunting task to bring human space launch back to the United States of America. Um, the, the contract mechanism that we've got in place, the procurement approach is, is different than before. The active involvement of the agency is uh, less than what it's been in the past. Um, you know, how, how have you learned to accommodate the lessons learned from Columbia in, in that environment? So I think, um, you know, when I, within the first week, that I was in the commercial crew program office. Um, Nigel and his team came and gave actually the, the, the program management an out brief of loss of signal and some of the key findings out of that. We were in the process of really building our requirement set for um, working with the providers and, and pulling together our, um, our requirement set for the crew transportation systems that we were going to be going out for procurement with our commercial providers. Um, so, so understanding really those lessons learned from the accident and making sure that those lessons were incorporated in our requirements, that, so making sure the abort requirements and the 
the crew, re the suit requirements and the seat requirements and the, the redundancy and, and making sure that we applied, you know, what Rex talked about, our PSA strategy and, and loss of crew requirements, loss of mission requirements. Um, so making sure that that the standard that we're applying with our commercial crew providers is the appropriate standard and taking those lessons learned. Not only lessons learned from Columbia, but lessons learned from what Orion had been working through also, right? Um, I, think, I think, you know, we, we as program managers find out that sometimes through failure you learn a lot. You sometimes learn more from that than you learn from success. And so I actually, when you look at all the things that we learn just from that requirement set, but also from you know, from a safety culture perspective, how do you make sure that you're having the right discussions? You know, we have a, a, a fixed price contract with our providers, and so it's something with us that we have to make sure that that communication is always there, that ability for them to talk about failures is always there, for us to talk about failures. You know, we, um, we have spent uh, that secret room that Pam set up and, and People, we are now using that as a learning experience. And I know, BK, you've been, you know, really, really good about every time I want to take any commercial provider through there so that we make sure that people are taking those lessons learned, that, that any data that we need to provide to these folks, and, and they all got a copy of the book from Wayne, they all got a copy of the book from me. I think there's a few copies of the book going around because really this is about what have we learned and then making sure that other people don't make the same mistakes, right? Or, or, or can learn from them and be able to apply them in the systems that they're doing. So this is a, it's a constant challenge. Um, we're also applying the technique where even after we're done with the designs, we work through certification, we, our providers are also um, required to do a crew survival assessment of their systems to even after going through and working through the whole verification, what would be the next areas that, that I as a program manager could invest in to further increase the capability of the systems that already meet our requirements, right? So I think um, that continuing to look at those kind of things over time too is, a, is another lessons learned that we have. So um, hopefully these are lessons <coughs> learned that, you know, a big job that Mark and I have as program managers is to make sure that the folks here in the room and the folks working in our programs are continuing to take those lessons, but then we are continuing to provide those new lessons because we will learn lessons out of our development and operations of our vehicles and make sure that the future programs and the people that are here that will be there in the 10 and 15 years working on those programs take what we've learned and then apply to make the systems that will be taking our people out into space even safer. Uh, thank you. So, Pat, uh, as you and I know, uh, Colonel Bob Benkin and Colonel Doug Hurley were both astronaut support personnel waiting for our Columbia crew uh, at KSC, and now they're, they're uh, our initial crew cadre in the, on the commercial crew program. But what do you see in terms of the crew's role, our astronauts' involvement in the development of these, uh, these new programs? Well, I, I think that we just have maybe a renewed focus in it. I believe that we've done from the very beginning with the Mercury program where we had the astronauts there as part of the development, on the floor, in the technical meetings, helping with displays, uh, software, and we've continued that all along. I understand uh, we did it well uh, with who we had in the beginning of the shuttle program, but I think just the renewed focus in making sure that we are as knowledgeable in the systems and the spacecraft as we can be for, for our benefit in the case of emergency, but also in the early development. But I, I've listened to some of the technical stuff about lessons learned and how we carry those forward. I'd also like to share, I've been reflecting as they talked about some other things we learned. I remember right after the accident as an office we came together, I think it was in the Hilton Hotel, and, uh, and we brought in our spouses and family members and began to talk about things. And I remember that very first day, I think our eyes were open to this treasure that we have of family, right? It's uh, our office mates, our teammates, our crewmates, 
and the family that's behind us. And I think for a while we were just so focused on our mission that we could kind of miss this this treasure that we had. And and again, I think that very first meeting we walked in, we said, hey, this is this is special and we need to protect this and we need to make sure uh, that we know how to protect it. I think I remember Rex giving a, a briefing on life insurance and someone else on will and, and we began to make sure that we had in place what we would need uh, both when things are going well on orbit for support of our crew and our families and also uh, what we would need when things went bad. And uh, that is one of the lessons that we've tried to keep alive since then is this sense of caring for our uh, astronaut and really our NASA families. Uh, thanks, Pat. So now we're going to shift just a teeny bit. We've got some uh, write-in questions. We'll probably spend maybe 15 minutes on what we got here. And then if need be, uh, at that point in time, roughly quarter after, if uh, uh, a few folks want to proceed to the microphone, we'll, I'll give some special hand signal and we'll head in that direction. But, but right now, even before we launch into that, is there anything that the panel members want to add? Uh, Wayne, Mike, you two in particular, got, that you would like to, before we dive into these questions? Well, I mentioned the, the response to the, to the two accidents, and, and I ask you to look at the Columbia response. One thing we in instituted that uh, Administrator O'Keefe was very, very much behind was, the, was what we call the debris loan program. And so Columbia is very much still alive and, and teaching people about what happens to spacecraft as they enter uh, enter the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. We got back more than 10 times all previous uncontrolled entry debris from the Columbia, uh, from, from any uncontrolled entry in the history of, of space flight. It's a treasure trove of information, uh, and that program is alive. There's over two tons of equipment or, or, or debris out for study right now. Three people have their Doctor of Philosophy degrees based on studying Columbia's debris. And so again, the, the response to Columbia versus the response to Challenger are just totally different. And so if you're interested in, in, uh, in, in uh, pursuing that program and looking at some of the debris, uh, contact the Columbia Preservation Office at the Kennedy Space Center. And there's an application process, but uh, Columbia continues to teach. I'd, I'd like to take a little bit different tack related uh, about the response to the, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board report. Um, you know, we were told to accept the report, and I heard at the time, and I still hear from middle-level and maybe sometimes senior-level managers now, mostly retired, but they say, well, CABE got it wrong. They didn't do it right. They got it wrong. Well, okay, it's a report, and there may be some detail somewhere that they didn't exactly describe right, and I, I grant you that, but overall, they got it right. And, and, and the real lesson, I think, coming out of that is you can't be arrogant. You need to listen to other people. We didn't know as much as we needed to know. And, and in that sense, we really do need to accept uh, the conclusions of that report. We, we did a lot of things differently after Columbia than we did before Columbia. Not that we were doing everything wrong or mostly wrong, but we weren't doing everything right. And we're probably still not doing everything right, but we're trying to to learn and go on. So if you ever hear anybody tell you, oh, the CABE report didn't get it right, okay, well, I'm not supposed to tell you to smack them in the nose, but <laughs> tell them that it, that's not the right attitude. We need to look for the things that they got right, and we need to follow the advice that they gave us because, you know, sometimes you can't see your own flaws, you can't see your own faults, and and it takes somebody to point them out to you. And my wife does that a good do deal for me. <laughs> and, and it's important. Um, so, so don't let anybody tell you the CABE got it wrong. Yeah, very good. Uh, so program managers, maybe it's schedule pressure. How, how are you dealing with it? It's a dynamic time. Um, I, well, so I, I, I think uh, what, what's, what you need to acknowledge, we, what, we need, what we always talk about is, is that you got to do it one step at a time, right? So, so really over the last four years, we've been told uh, you need to fly in two years or you need to do this. And I think, you know, um, after we awarded the contracts, 
you know, my team kind of was like, oh, we got to get this all done at this period of time. And I said, how about we plan for the next three months? <laughs> how about we go look at what do we need to get done over the next three months? And then we'll go figure out what do we need to get done over the next three months, right? Because um, you, we, you know, you can't, you can't be looking at what am I going to do in six months and you, we haven't even made it, you know, one foot <laughs> down the road. And so I think you just, yes, we need to, we want to get there as quickly as possible, but you got to get there one step at a time. And so uh, the constant challenge is to get people to see what those intermediate steps are and focus on that and and then work through and the schedule will be what the schedule is, right? We have to make sure that when we fly, we're flying safely. And it doesn't matter if we get there fast, if we're not flying safely, we're not gonna get off the ground. And so I think you just, as, a, as program managers, and I'm sure Mark will say, this, we have to focus on what do we need to do, get it done as quickly as possible, but, but don't be hampered by that end date. And so it's a, it's a huge challenge for us. This will be a huge challenge for us this year because we would like to at least be flying our uncrewed demos this year. We, I would love to be flying my crewed demos this year, right? That would be a beautiful thing, but we, ha we know that we've got to work through it and do it safely or else we won't be flying our, our crew rotation missions, which is absolutely our end goal. Yeah. Yeah, Kathy, great, great ideas. In fact, um, we went through a similar process a couple of years ago. We were focused on the end game, and it really is important. What, what are those key milestones in the next couple of months and keep clicking them off? But, but there's other things, too, that we considered. And in fact, um, yesterday, probably many of us participated in the quality audit. I know I at least did. And um, getting ready for that, I reviewed the JSC uh, quality policy that, and it's, it's really good it says we want to meet or exceed our customer requirements with respect to safety performance schedule and cost and 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 that you know to me that's directly applicable what we're talking about here it's it's not I just can't be a program manager and worry about schedule and conversely I just can't worry about safety we we have to work together as a team to balance all of those and, and like Kathy, it's very appropriate now because last year, Orion, we didn't do very well on schedule. So this year, we know we have to do better if we're going to be successful. And, and a lot of these things aren't, e aren't easy. So in fact, as a, as a management team, as a leadership team, we're going to go talk about this, this this Friday. I just can't say, boy, you need more schedule urgency. You know, you can only, I'm not asking the people, you're working 60 hours a week, I want you to work 75 hours a week. Um, you have to find ways, ways to move faster. And so as I'm thinking about this, as I reviewed the JSC quality policy, then this Sunday I opened up activity reports. And, you know, I, I started reading these, and my God, if right there in the activity reports, there, there they were examples of, of urgency right there, and the team's doing it, the team's finding ways. And just two that just from this week's activity report, for example, um, we, are, we are coding our windows that we're going to put on the M1 spacecraft by this small vendor. And, um, and apparently we, in combination with other customers, have overloaded. And we do this a lot, by the way. We've overloaded this vendor. And they told us just a, a week or two ago, by the way, it's going to be a month slip. So, so you know, we didn't just say, well, forget the coding. What the team did is they, they said, OK, what are our alternatives? And they said, boy, that company really knows how to do coding. We don't want to move the coding. But the, the driver of this company schedule was the NDE, the inspection that comes afterwards. So the team found another place to do the NDE and pulled that schedule slip two back. So again, that's, that's an example. You talk about how not only is the performance important, the safety important, but we got to meet the schedule. So the team worked it. Uh, another example just recently, boy, you talk about a day, it wasn't a very good day. Actually, I was on an airplane. I was on an airplane flying to Europe, and we got this. I got an email. I was logged on the internet, and it said uh, these quantity sensors, quantity sensors that go in in fluid <coughs> systems, both on the crew module and our service module, our European service module. They were going through their test program, and and these quantity sensors started falling apart. Not a good thing, really. And and by the way, 
all of these devices where these sensors are in, the pumps, the pumps on the service module, the pumps on the crew module, they're fully assembled. In fact, the month prior, I was at UTES and I saw the pumps. Bigger than a breadbasket, fully assembled. So to get at these sensors, we would have to take it apart. So again, one of the things we could have looked at, boy, is it okay if the sensors fall apart? And by the way, we did ask that question. <laughs> but when we found out, yeah, it probably wouldn't be a good thing, especially in the service module if they fell apart, um, we, we got serious about, about fixing them. And I talked, I called Alan Flint, many of you know Alan, who now heads the U-Test decision. I said, Alan, this is going to be a problem. And he prioritized it, and, and it was amazing. It's a very long contractor change, especially for <coughs> ESA, from UTAS to TAZI, the company that then takes it to the next higher assembly. But we got all, all, all of the people involved in that contractor change together. And it's amazing that, that, so we had to take these boxes apart, get new sensors, weld them back together and ship it, and it actually only moved our schedule by, by two weeks from the 1st of June to the 15th of June. So there's ways, when you, when you have this, there's ways to do both. And that, that's what our challenge is. We have, to, we have to do just like Ellen's told us in the quality policy. We have to meet safety and performance and schedule and cost, and that's our job. Okay, very good. Let me address this next question to kind of the flight ops folks because I want to take a few notes here, right? We've got to get our flight operations team, our crew members, the, the team of, of flight controllers and trainers uh, ready for future exploration and deep space missions. How, what are your thoughts on how we apply the lessons learned from uh, Columbia in getting our crew members ready and then the notion of planning and training and flying uh, deep space missions. Uh, uh, Pat, you want to talk first and then maybe Mark and Wayne? Well, again, I think the first thing is to give them the confidence that we're headed that direction, uh, give them that focus and, and that mission. Uh, then I believe it's a matter of identifying uh, the types of people that we would want to use uh, for those missions, and then to train them as best we can, to give them the opportunity to become uh, experts in the system, uh, experts in the mission, and give them the resources and the tools, I think, uh, for them to do that. Because I, I believe uh, all of our crew members are capable of, of doing that as we, as we move forward. Uh, what can we take directly away from uh, the Columbia Excellent. I, I think, again, just, just focus. Uh, we do need uh, trust in, in our program managers and in the, the people that are, are building the vehicles, and, and I believe that we can get that as, as we get to participate in, in the programs. Uh, that's how we get our confidence. Okay. Wayne? Wayne, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, and then we'll follow up with Mark. Okay. Tough and competent. You know, I was raised, I went to the Gene Cran School for Young Boys, and, and I got taught from a young age about Apollo 13 and Apollo 1, and some of the really interesting things that happened in Gemini, and if you need to go back and study those history if you haven't, because the number one thing, I think, in flight ops is to be prepared for the unexpected. You gotta think about what might happen, all the ways it might happen, and think through, not that you're ever gonna think about when the day comes, you'll never, never have exactly that scenario, but it puts you in a mindset to, to think outside the box, to be prepared, number one. Number two, have reach back. Because flight ops is operating, and, and, and I, as much as I love being in flight ops, we didn't know everything. And, and uh, we had a good mission evaluation room, cadre, a MER, that was right there, shoulder to shoulder with us. We had reach back to the prime contractors, to the subcontractors, <coughs> to the park vendors. And if we had a question about how something might work or might fail or what the pedigree history was or how it was tested and what were the limits that it might be able to endure, we had reach back. And being able to get on the phone or, you know, electronically reach back to those folks that, after all, are a whole lot smarter than flight ops people, let's get real, um, about their particular thing. You know, we, we get to be a, uh, a, an inch deep and a mile wide, and sometimes you need the expert that's a mile deep on an inch 
wide subject and and having that reach back is entirely important. So if I could just add one more thing uh, based on what Wayne said. I think one of the things that we are doing and we can continue to do as we're developing these vehicles and we've identified a crew is that they see us supporting them in some of the issues that we're finding as the vehicles are being developed. That crew safety, that they're seeing their management and leadership stand behind them and concerns <coughs> with the vehicles, I, I think that gains a lot and, and uh, I think it's important. Active involvement. Okay, Mark? Yeah, uh, just yeah, following up a little bit on Pat and Wayne, are now in the, in, in the phase we're in right now where the hardware and the software is just coming together, uh, you know, one of the things we're doing with both the, the team at the Kennedy Space Center that's going to assemble the spacecraft and turn it on for the first time with, as an integrated element, and the flight control team here is getting, getting them involved. And actually, this, goes, this dates back to the earliest days of the program, but making sure, as you said, they're, they're with us every, every day. We have this design choice. We can go A or B. And, and the flight operations people, I know, think differently than the engineers do. So, so getting their input, and, 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 and they've been a key part of the, our, our team. And it's, it's very important to have the trust, too, that, that Pat mentioned, that, that they can trust in us and we can trust in them. I can, I can go, to, go to, for example, uh, Nicole or Jim Spivey and say, boy, I have this really hard problem. It doesn't all fit, and, and, and have them help me. Uh, work through these problems because often, often on these really hard, we're doing things that never done before. There's no, there's no single answer that satisfies all the constraints. So we try to get the folks involved, and we try to build a strong teamwork between us to establish that trust. Okay. Mike, it sounds. I, I have one more. I want to go back. <laughs> the biggest concern I have going forward, the biggest risk I think you have, is you don't have Captain Young writing you a memo yeah, yeah. once a week. You don't have Captain Young standing up in the Where's FR the saying, no offense, I'm just asking, and just asking those questions that people didn't want to answer. So yeah. you need we, We've who, got Captain got Young. That? We've got Captain Young. Mike? I, I would like to put in a, maybe a plug for the, for the JSC flight control team and the, and the Kennedy launch team, maybe to work together a little bit more than we did in the past. Um, there's uh, after shuttle, like here, well back at KSC we lost quite a, quite a few members of the launch control team. <clears throat> the ones that are still there are a tremendous resource. You guys out here are a tremendous resource. And I just recall the launch countdown simulation days where we had Wayne and his team with us on net and, and it just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, and so I would, I would recommend, as Mark yep. started touching on, um, you know, maybe, maybe we can train as an integrated team a little bit more because, uh, uh, it, it, again, it's the right thing to do. I always felt good when, when uh, I could call up on the net and have a flight director or e-com out here or someone answer a, a, a question. And, um, you know, maybe we can work together more. Yeah, we'll be doing it. I think um, the unique aspect, and I, I think, Pat, I think, uh, the flight operations group actually for the commercial crew has been an essential part of transmitting the data from 50 years of experience to these commercial providers. I mean, uh, not just there to support, but actually to aid and ensure that the commercial providers have all the information, all the lessons learned that we have, all that, and then help them as they're building their systems to be able to um, eventually operate and, and deliver crew transportation for us. Critical, critical aspect of the program for us. I mean, um, having the cadre there, they are there not only to, to criticize, but to help and aid and support and, and going out and doing, um, you know, what we call our office hours for the last two years and just being available and, and there for the young engineers at SpaceX and Boeing to be able to come up and just ask any kinds of questions and, and get feedback and look at systems along with, with um, them getting familiar with the systems has just been absolutely critical. Yeah, outstanding. Are there any other closing comments from the team here? Well, you know, on behalf of the Johnson Space Center, of course, we, we appreciate this opportunity here. Uh, Ellen, thank you for giving us the opportunity to get up here and talk. Uh, there's just a couple of things I'd like to say. 
When I think about mission focus and what we do, it matters tremendously in flight operations. We know our mission. We're here to select and protect our astronauts, to plan, train, and fly our human space flight and aviation missions. No matter what mission we get, the, the resolve, the toughness, the competence that you hear about here, we will be re-energized each and every day and even more so coming out of here. But for the Johnson Space Center, what do we, what do we stand for? What is our mission? Our mission is clear. We are to lead human space exploration for the United States of America. We are to operate the International Space Station on a daily basis as that foundation for exploration going forward. And we're going to do that day in and day out, 24-7, 365, and support a Kirk and the rest of the team and the rest of the international partnership because that's going to lead us towards exploration. We as a team at the Johnson Space Center are going to enable and support the development of the commercial crew program because this industry is good for America. It's good for us in the United States of America. We are going to ensure their success because it matters to our people, to those risk takers that we send out there. In terms of exploration, that's our duty. It's all leading in this direction to go where we've never gone before to help and enable the success of the Orion program. We will be there from the Johnson Space Center. The fight and FOD is going to be there day in and day out, and we are going to listen and support in, in every respect. And when we wrap this all together, people, when we learn from this tragedy, the human sacrifice, the loss of friends, everything that you've heard before, it leads us on this pathway to be able to support this great endeavor that is not without risk. So never think that it is. That's our legacy. That is what we get to do to honor the people that have lost their lives in support of the United States of America, in support of this great agency, and in support of human spaceflight and exploration. So with that said, uh, I'd say a round of applause for these great people, and that, that ends our get together. Thank you, Thank you very much.